Community Cats podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats podcast. I am your host, Stacey LeBaron. I have been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. Today, we are speaking with Dr. Sarah White. After graduating from veterinary school at North Carolina State University in 1998, Sarah moved to Vermont to work in mixed animal practice, and in 2000, she began work as an on-staff shelter veterinarian in New Hampshire. Since 2006, Sarah has operated Spay ASAP Incorporated, a nonprofit MASH-style mobile spay-neuter clinic that collaborates with humane organizations in Vermont and New Hampshire to provide spay and neuter for shelter animals, low-income pets, and feral cats. Since that time, she has spayed and neutered more than 40,000, that's 40,000 cats and dogs in Vermont and New Hampshire. Sarah is a co-author of both the 2008 and 2016 versions of the Association of Shelter Veterinarians Veterinary Medical Care Guidelines for Spay-Neuter Programs and is a past board member of Association of Shelter Veterinarians. She is also currently on the board of directors of Shelter Animals Count and is president-elect of the Vermont Veterinary Medical Association. While working in spay-neuter, Sarah developed an interest in ergonomics, health, well-being, and injury in veterinarians and staff. In 2013, she published Prevalence and Risk Factors Associated with Musculoskeletal Discomfort in Spay and Neuter Veterinarians. And in spring 2015, she completed a Master's of Science in Health Ergonomics from University of Derby in the UK. Sarah, I'd like to welcome you to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here, Stacey. I can't believe that 40. 40,000 40, cats and dogs with your little two hands. That's amazing. Congratulations on uh, reaching that number of cats and dogs that you have done uh, since you started your program. Thank you. And a few rabbits in there as well. But <laughs> yeah, it's it's been a, a great time. And I've had a lot of fun collaborating with humane organizations throughout Vermont and New Hampshire in order to help make that possible. How did you fall in love and decided to become a veterinarian? I had always been interested in science, in um, biology and animals and plants. And I discovered when I was in college that if you become a scientist of other types, you often end up having to sit around and write grants rather than getting to touch the animals. And versus being a veterinarian, you get your degree and you actually get to do more with animals. So it was a way to get to have a professional life that was hands-on with animals, which is what I really wanted. Well then, so when you decided to get into doing a high volume spay neuter, was it because you saw a a problem, a situation that needed to be addressed and you just sort of were like, well, I'm going to figure it out? Or did you have a mentor that sort of guided you in this path? I did have a mentor, but I had also definitely recognized when I was working at a shelter that was really taking care of the animals within its own walls, but didn't have community programs, was recognizing how much those community programs were needed and would receive phone calls sometimes from people who had feral cats or who had noticed neighborhood cats that they knew they wanted to get them spayed and neutered and they couldn't afford to do it. And I had nothing to offer them. So it was partly out of that frustration, realizing that we were, we were putting out the fires once they were already set by only taking care of the animals in the shelter rather than preventing them from coming in. So I realized after a few years in shelter practice that, that spaying and neutering was really my passion Then initially I wanted to start working for someone as a spay-neuter vet, but there wasn't anyone in my geographic area at that time looking to hire one, although a lot of people, a lot of humane organizations wanted to have that service. And I met Leslie Appel from Ithaca, New York, who at the time was working for the ASPCA 
and had started a mash style spay neuter clinic in Ithaca several years before. So she invited me to come and see her clinic, which is called SOS, Shelter Outreach Services, and also was able to give me a startup grant through the ASPCA in order to start my MASH clinic. So that really um, sent me down the road of this particular model of clinic. Um, And that was in 2006 that we met and that I started my clinic. It's so common when I'm talking with folks on the show that you basically said, I went down this path because I saw that there was a need and I decided to do something about it. Very often I would have lists and lists and lists of people requesting for help with funding spay neuter for feral cats in Massachusetts back in the late 90s. And I'd have these handwritten spreadsheets. How can I help these people? I can't take all these cats into the shelter and they don't need to come into the shelter, but yet I can't pay full price for these cats to get spayed or neutered. And that was where we started our monthly mash style clinics. I wasn't capable. I wasn't a veterinarian, so I wasn't able to just say, okay, I'll open the doors and do it myself. And it sounds like you were like, well, I can do this. So let's just make it happen. Yeah, it it was. And I think that for me, the mash style clinic was a way that I could make that happen as a veterinarian who wanted to get something started sooner rather than later. And I didn't have the the resources of a large humane organization with an endowment. I needed to get a job sooner rather than later and was able, within three months of incorporating, I was doing my first surgery. So it was a lot faster path than I think it would have been had I tried to start a stationary clinic or had I tried to do the clinic as part of a humane society instead of doing it as its own organization that could really focus on the one thing that we wanted to do, which was provide spay and neuter rather than having to think about adoptions and having to think about intake and um, all the other things that humane societies have to consider. I was able to focus on my goal of providing spay and neuter. Right. There's the acronym FOCUS, follow one course until success. And it sounds like that's what you did was you said, I have this path. I'm going to make it happen. And I think that's something that's very good for everybody, whether you're a veterinarian, whether you're running an organization, whether you're just an individual person trying to help out, you know, a neighborhood colony of cats is just focus, be targeted and focus on on one project and you'll end up being much more successful that way. I want to turn the conversation a little bit towards sort of a health and well-being conversation as well as your area of interest in ergonomics. I find this area extremely fascinating because I've seen so many folks work so hard, work so hard, and not take care of themselves in their workplace or outside of work. So what are your thoughts with regards to veterinarians specifically? How can they make their workplace better for them? That's a complicated question, and (laughs) and, uh, part of the answer is it depends, and there are many things. In general, I think that recognizing that doing surgery, practicing veterinary medicine is a physical task. It is you're like an athlete or a musician where you're using your body to accomplish your, your goals, and that we haven't really been taught in school, whether whether you're a veterinarian or a technician, you're not really taught how to take care of this instrument that you have. I think first being aware that you do have to take care of yourself and be aware of the ways that you're using your body as you do the work. Looking for a great tool to help educate your neighbors about community cats? Check out this sign available from the folks at Lumen LS, a life-saving organization from Broward County, Florida, that believes no cat should be left behind. This sturdy, bright orange sign featuring an ear-tipped cat would be great for cat colony caretakers, shelters and rescues, spay-neuter clinics, or municipalities and animal control organizations. Education about the correct ways to manage community cats is exploding in the U.S., especially in the last five years. This sign will help you let your community know that ear-tipped cats have been fixed and vaccinated and pose no threat to them. The community cat sign comes complete with all of the hardware you need to post it, Buying and posting the sign will help move animal welfare forward and improve outcomes for cats in your area. You can view and purchase the signs directly from our Facebook page at Lumen LS. They also have a colorful informational brochure about community cats plus lots of other resources. 
Support the Community Cats podcast and LuminLS.org by going to LuminLS on Facebook today. Do you have any specific tips for veterinarian? Are there tools that you have used in your practice for success? Okay, so for veterinarians who are doing surgery, the simple things to think about are your body comfort, considering animal positioning and whether the height of your table is comfortable, whether you're adjusting it between cats and dogs, between smaller and larger patients, so that you are never having to bend over in order to look at your patient or so that you're not having to raise your arms and elbows uncomfortably in order to do surgery. Um, Other things like making sure that your patient isn't too far away on the table or too close can help keep your neck at a comfortable angle so that you're not having to bend too much or so that you're not having to reach far away to get to a small patient in the middle of a large table. I think everybody in the veterinary clinic does a lot of lifting and considering ways that you may not have to lift as much weight. So instead of carrying heavy objects, can you put them on a cart and wheel them? In doing two-person lifts, are you well-coordinated? Are you lifting a dog perhaps on a stretcher rather than lifting the floppy anesthetized dog? So when you're, how about lifting up traps and stuff like that? With lifting traps, lifting and carrying traps, there's both the weight of the trap and the way that you're likely, if you're carrying one trap, to be leaning to the side to sort of counterbalance the weight of the trap. So depending on your strength and the size of the traps, it may be easier to carry two rather than one. But it's also a time when I have a wonderful picture of a clinic volunteer with a cat in a trap that she had rigged up her her sled, her child's sled, to move the cat across the parking lot. So rather than carrying the trap on the slippery, icy parking lot, she just put the trap in the sled and and, uh, slid the cat right into the (laughs) clinic. So trying to think of ways that you can actually reduce the, the work and strain on your body whenever possible. In my MASH clinic, we have things in totes that's a lot of carrying and a lot of lifting, but in places where we can roll a cart inside, where we don't have a flight of stairs, we do put items on a cart to roll them in rather than carrying all those totes individually. When you can think of a cheap and easy way to make the work less, to make the, make the strain less, that's always a good idea. Considering surgeons and ergonomics, as well as the veterinary technicians, being careful about the way you use your hands, because hand and arm wrist pain are all things that veterinarians for sure will experience with surgery, but the technicians also who are doing a lot of clipping, a lot of restraining, a lot of injecting, are have a lot of repetitive hand motions as well. Recognizing if you have areas that are uncomfortable, try videotaping what you're doing and seeing if you can figure out what it is that you're doing that's, say, making that thumb hurt or making that wrist hurt and figuring out if there's another way to do the same thing. Maybe also by videotaping other people who um, who do or don't have that same painful experience who may be able to if not, if even if they can't give you advice on how to change, you may be able to see it when comparing tapes of yourself and tapes of somebody else who does something differently. There's not a single way to hold a surgery instrument or hold a pair of clippers that will make your life better, that will make your hands never hurt. But there are a lot of different ways that people do those same tasks. And some one of those or several of those are going to be ways that might hurt less than what you're doing now if you've got some pain in your hands. I had hoped that I would learn the perfect solution to surgery technique you know, ergonomic surgery technique when I was in school. And that wasn't what I learned. What I learned is that we've got a lot of variety out there and that that the same methods aren't ideal for everybody, but that there are enough ways to do the tasks and do them efficiently and do them effectively and safely that you'll probably be able to find some way that you can that you can continue to do the work and keep comfortable while you're doing it. So I want to turn the tables just a little bit and talk a little bit about health and well-being. 
ergonomics is focused on sort of what to do in the workplace. You have your own personal health and your own strength. And if you are carrying extra weight or you have certain situations going on, standing on your feet all day can be tough. And some nonprofits aren't really particularly supportive when it comes to benefits. And so I would think it would be very important for us sort of outside of the work hours to focus on our own physical health and well-being and hope that the organizations we do work with should maybe change some of those attitudes. I know it it all talks about dollars and all that kind of stuff, but I think that if we can take care of our bodies, that will make us healthier and, and feel better about our jobs and also be able to prevent injuries. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think it's, it is a balance between what employees can do for themselves on their own time, but also not having bosses or organizations with expectations that are inappropriate or that are expecting the veterinary staff to do more work or more hours than is possible with the resources that they have. I also think that there are a lot of modifications or ways that you can support health at work that aren't necessarily expensive. So uh, an, an example would be alternating between standing and sitting for different surgeries or standing on a comfortable mat, which you can sometimes even get donated or get a free sample, which is probably all you need is that free sample mat. I think that even even places with very low budgets may be able to come up with ways to keep to keep staff comfortable and to have the number of hours that they're expected to work and the amount of pressure on employees to be appropriate, not to push people harder than than they're comfortable with. Do you feel that that might be a reason why there seems to be a fair amount of turnover with shelter veterinarians and high volumes veterinarians? I think it depends. I mean, I think for some people, it may be that the the work isn't what they like or what they expected. I think in some cases, there is a, especially in a larger organization, there's more chances for disconnect between the knowledge and mission in different parts of the organization. So the person who's making financial decisions may not have worked in the veterinary section before, in the clinic before, so they won't necessarily understand either what to expect, you know, how many surgeries can you expect a surgeon to do? Maybe you've heard at a conference that such and such clinic does 50 animals a day, but there are very specific circumstances that lead that clinic to be able to do that and that you can't simply lay down an expectation and expect any team with any amount of resources to be able to produce that expectation. So I think that that, that can be frustrating for some spay neuter and shelter vets if they if they have expectations that um, they just can't meet with the knowledge and staffing and resources that they have. And I think it can be frustrating in the other direction too, where it's hard for managers to know if their vet's concerns are legitimate or if the vet is just not up to the task of doing high volume surgery or, you know, how do you know if they're, if you're, if you don't have the knowledge in that field, how do you know if your vet is shirking or if they're, if their complaints are legitimate? So I think it's, I think it can be hard on both sides not to know how to manage those different levels of knowledge. And, you know, it's a very hard balancing act that, you know, we all have with regards to managing veterinarians, understanding what the expectations are, and then and having the veterinarian understanding, you know, what, what they can do on a daily basis in a high volume, high quality uh, situation. Sarah, if there are folks that are interested in, in finding out more about the ergonomics and some of the research that you're doing, you have, you, in our pre-show interview, you referenced, you know, a questionnaire that you had sent out to veterinarians and you've done some research in this area. And just wondering if there were folks who are interested in finding out more, how could they reach you? Well, I've got a couple of things that they could do. They would could certainly email me at sheltervet at mac.com. So that's S-H-E-L-T-E-R-V-E-T at M-A-C.com. 
I also have a website that is ergovet.com. So E-R-G-O-V-E-T. And I have links to my research there. I also have a lot of illustrations and writing about ergonomics in the surgery day and other things that people may find interesting. That's great. We'll make sure we get that website out in our show notes too. Is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners today? No, thank you, Stacy. Sarah, I want to thank you so much for agreeing to be a guest on my show, and I hope we'll have you on in the future. All right. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to the Community Cats podcast. I would really appreciate it if you would go to iTunes and leave a review of the show. It will help spread the word to help more community cats. 